I've been talking about EF Core on this channel for many years now, but there is one topic that I never discussed before, until today that is. This topic is database first when using EF Core. We're going to take an existing database, scaffold a database context using EF Core, and then I'm going to discuss some of the pros and cons of this approach and how to use it from your .NET applications. So this is going to be my solution. I have an empty .NET 9 API. It's orchestrated with Aspire. Aspire already has this project wired up. We're going to introduce a database. I'll be using Postgres, but this works basically with any relational provider for EF Core. And here's the SQL script that I'm going to use to create my database. It's going to have a bunch of tables inside, indexes, any unique constraints, and I'm also going to seed some dummy data so that we actually have what to work with. So I'll use Aspire to add a Postgres instance. Let's add an Aspire package for the Aspire hosting Postgres library. I'll install the latest version. And now I can create a database in my app host. So I'll say builder add Postgres. I need to give my instance a name. I'll call it Postgres. Let's add the container lifetime. I have to say with lifetime and I'll say container lifetime persistent so that the Docker instance of my database survives application restarts. Then I'll say with data volume so that this actually persists my data. And then I'll add a database, which I will call event management. Let's store this in a variable and I'm going to reference it from my API project so that I get a connection string. So now when I start this, I'll have a Postgres instance that I can use. It's going to be empty, but we're going to run our migration script to create the tables and see the data. And what I'll also need is the connection string. So let's take it one step at a time. First, I'll start the application and you can see my database is up and running. I also have the event management database created within Postgres and then my ticketing API contains the connection string to this database. So let's take a look at this connection string. This is the connection string name and the actual value is localhost. Here's the port that was randomly assigned to this instance. And then here is the password that I can use to connect to it. So I'll use these details to connect to my database from dbeaver. So here's my database instance inside of dbeaver. And if I open up the available databases, there's the default Postgres instance and then the event management database. If I open up the schemas, there's the default schema, but no tables inside. So let's open up the SQL editor and I'll drop in the SQL that's required to seed my database and all of my data. So let's select everything run it, it all completes, and we have our database. So let's close this down. I'll refresh the schemas and note that we now have a ticketing schema as well as the tables. So if I open up the database diagram, we can see all of the tables that we have here. And this is actually part of a larger application that I built inside of my modular monolith architecture course. And this particular schema is part of the ticketing module within the larger application that deals with event management. So we have the orders table, order items, tickets and ticket types, events, customers, and payments. We also have some sample data inside that we can use to test out our application once we scaffold the database context. So we have our database. So let's go back to our application and see how we can convert this into an EF core database context and the respective data model. We'll shift our focus to the ticketing API where I want to install a few NuGet packages. First, I'll use the Aspire client library for Postgres. This is also going to install the respective EF core provider. And then I'll install the EF core tooling, which will allow me to call some CLI commands to scaffold my database context. So Aspire is going to wire up the event management connection string for us. So once I have my database context, I'll be able to configure it to use this database. But first we need to come up with the database context. So with these libraries installed, I'll open up the package manager console and we want to type out the command is going to allow us to scaffold a DB context. The command is called scaffold DB context. The first argument is going to be a connection string to the actual database which you want to generate an EF core model for. So the tricky part here when using Aspire is going to be figuring out the port. I recommend opening up your database instance in Docker and looking up the actual port. And the next argument is going to be your EF core provider. In my case, this is MPG SQL Entity Framework Core Postgres. So I'll drop that. And I'm also going to add the output directory where I want to generate my EF core model. This is going to be database. So I'm going to run this and I'm getting an exception because I have the wrong startup project. I'll change this to ticketing API and rerun it. And we have one warning here related to the connection string. You'll see why this is the case. We now have our event management database context. It also contains all of our entities inside represented as database sets. And then here is the warning. You can see there is a hard coded connection string, which I'm going to completely get rid of. So let's remove that. 
And then we have the on model creating, which is configuring all of our entities. It's respecting my Postgres naming convention using lowercase for the tables. It's also figuring out that we have a custom schema called ticketing for all of these tables. It's configuring any indexes and relationships between our tables. You can see the index here. You can see the relationships here. It's also respecting the foreign key constraints. So our complete model is now translated from our database representation into our C -sharp code. Also in the database folder are all of the entities. So we have an event, an order with its order items. You can notice that we also have navigation properties for all of these entities. Then there is the ticket, the ticket type, the payment. So everything we had in our database model is now present in our C -sharp code. So then the next thing is, we have to configure this with dependency injection. I'll say builder services add db context. I'll specify the event management context as the argument here. We have to provide a connection string. So I'll say options use mpg sql. And then I'll grab the connection string using builder configuration get connection string. And the name of the connection string is event management. I'll also enrich my database context by providing it here. This is an extension method added by the Aspire library and is going to add some resilience with retries, health checks, logging, and telemetry to your database context. And now what's left is to test out if this actually works. So let's expose a simple get endpoint that's going to use our event management context. Let's call this the DP context. And in the request delegate, I'm just going to return everything in the orders database set as the response of this API. So I'll say DB context orders, let's say as no tracking, and then let's say to list async. And of course, because this is async, I have to await it. So let's start the application and I'll send the get request to this endpoint from Postman. And you can see that we are getting back a response which contains the one order that we have in our system. Now, this is an anti-pattern in my opinion because we're returning the database model and this has a bunch of problems. It prevents evolving your API because it's tied to how your database model looks like. So you can't control what you're returning and all of the navigation properties here aren't even returned. Now, if you try to add them by saying include and then including, for example, the order items, and then restarting this. And if I try to send the same request, you'll notice that we're getting an internal server error. This is because our order items also have a navigation property pointing to our order, which is causing an infinite loop in JSON serialization, and you can't easily return this type of object. So I think we can conclude that returning entities is bad. Now, how can we improve it? Well, I'm going to drop in a bunch of DTOs into my API. So these are going to be the customer DTO, the event DTO, the order DTO, the order item DTO, the payment DTO, the ticket DTO, and the ticket type DTO. These are all of the objects that I'm going to return from my API endpoint. And now I just need to write a projection that's going to take the orders and convert them into an order DTO with all of the associated relationships. As you can imagine, a query like this might not be so simple. So here's what this projection looks like. We're returning an order DTO, including a customer, including the order items. The order items themselves contain the ticket type. The ticket type contains the event. We're also including the payments, again with the event and ticket type. So let's save this and start the application again. And let's resend this request from Postman. And this time we're getting back a valid response from the API. And it's this complicated object containing everything possible about the order. We've managed to complete the loop with our database first approach by scaffolding a database context, using it from our API, and finally returning some data to the client. Now let's spend a moment to discuss how you can evolve this type of database context. There's two approaches you can take here. One is to continue using database first. You make all of your changes in your database using SQL commands to add columns, update the types of these columns, create new tables, delete tables, and so on. And then you just run the scaffold DB context command again, and it's going to update your database context to the latest snapshot of your database. I've used this approach in the past and it works okay. The one issue I've constantly seen is having a bunch of merge conflicts when one of your teammates is making one change to the database and they scaffold the database context, you're doing the same. And when you try to merge these two branches, all hell breaks loose. Now, the second approach you can take is after scaffolding the context from your database, continue using code first in your code. So you have a completely valid database context with its configuration, and you can continue updating it 
from your code, generating database migrations using EF Core, and then converting that into SQL to update your database. So you decide what works best for you. This is just a short demo into using the database first approach with EF Core. Now, if you're interested about making your application as fast as possible, I think you'll enjoy watching this video next where I discuss optimizing EF Core queries for maximum performance. Thanks a lot for watching this video. Consider smashing the like button for the YouTube algorithm. And until next time, stay awesome.